being recorded. <laughs> um, and this session is focused on women in the law in honor of Women's History Month and International Women's Day, which was yesterday. Um, so I am Rachel Simon. I'm an associate at Miller, Shackman, Levine, and Feldman in Chicago. And my co-moderator, Judy, I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Judy Conway. I'm a trial attorney at Cooney and Conway, also in Chicago. All right. Um, so as you can see, we have three distinguished judges here with us to have a, a discussion. Um, and so I, I think Blake has taken care of this already, but just in case you want to only see um, the judges and the moderators, um, I think you can go to view and do show pin participants. Um, you can hide non-video participants um, and kind of create the gallery that you want to see. So if you have questions about that, um, you can put it in the chat. Um, speaking of the chat, um, I think Phil noted that you should feel free to put questions and comments in there kind of throughout. Um, if you're, you know, if you have a question about or a comment about something we're talking about. Um, you definitely don't have to wait until the end. Go ahead and just put it in the chat and we'll we'll try to address it um, or we can address it at the end, um, kind of depending. So with that being said, I'm just going to kick off and introduce our panel. Um, so first we've got Justice Judy Cates of the Illinois Appellate Court Fifth District. And um, you know, I'm just going to give very brief bios because I think some of this will come out in the conversations and I don't want to take up the whole hour with all of their accomplishments. So um, Justice Cates was in private practice for 30 years before she was elected to the Fifth District Appellate Court in 2012. Um, she was the first woman to serve as president of the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association. And she was also named one of the top 50 women lawyers in the state of Illinois. Very impressive. Um, we have Judge Lisa Wilson on the 10th Judicial Circuit in Peoria County Domestic Relations Division. Before being appointed to the bench in 2009, um, Judge Wilson spent most of her career at Prairie State Legal Services, where she became a managing attorney. Um, she was awarded the Week 25 Women in Leadership Award in 2004. And in 2016, she was honored with the uh, Business Professions Award at the Women to Women Leader Luncheon, which was sponsored by the Women's Fund of the Community Foundation of Central Illinois. Finally, um, we have Judge Deborah Walker of the Cook County Circuit Court Domestic Relations Division. Um, judge Walker was in private practice before she was elected as a judge in 2008. Um, she's a past president of the Women's Bar Association of Illinois. And in 2012, she received the Women's Bar Association of Illinois' Mary Heftel Hooten Award for her work to advance the cause of women in the law. So I am so appreciative for all three of you joining us today. Um, looking forward to a good conversation. So, um, <laughs> yes. So let's just uh, go ahead and kick it off. Um, so I'm going to start with Justice Kate, but then this is, you know, a question for all of you. Um, if you could just please tell us, you know, a little bit about your background and just what got you interested in a career in the law. Um, I'll let you go. Well, I'm from a small town in Southern Illinois, um, near St. Louis on the um, Western border of Illinois. And, um, you know, I grew up in an era of the Vietnam War where there was a lot of political uprising and issues going on. And so I became interested in politics and did an undergraduate degree in government. So I became interested in the law through the political process. And um, when, when I went to work um, as a law student, I was at Washington University in St. Louis and I needed a job while I worked through law school. So I just happened to work for a trial attorney who did personal injury work. And I was his law clerk for the three years, two and a half years while I was in law school. And so I became interested in the legal litigation uh, field through that process, going to 
depositions with him, doing interrogatories, researching cases, and things like that. So that really jump-started me into the litigation arena, which is where I ended up practicing. Um, Judge Wilson, what about you? Well, um, my background was that, you know, I, I grew up in a smaller town, Peoria Heights, and went to a small high school. Um, and then trying, trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I went away to college, I was always stronger, like in English and social studies and the reading and writing, all the language stuff. So I majored in history um, with the eye of going to law school. And I really didn't have anyone in my family that had a legal background. Um, neither of my parents graduated from high school. And I was one of the first um, persons in my family that actually went to college. And so I think I was motivated to, um, I wanted to really accomplish something. And I also wanted to help wherever I ended up, I wanted to help the community. So that's really kind of how I ended up in the legal profession. And then when I was in law school, I had clerked for a private firm one summer uh, between my first and second year. And then I had an opportunity to clerk at Land of Lincoln Legal Assistance Foundation, uh, which covers really the Southern part of the state. And I was in Springfield, which is the capital, obviously of Illinois, and really um, just fell in love with the work that legal aid did. And so I started out my career in the Springfield office for about three years. And then a position opened up at Prairie State um, in my hometown, basically of Peoria. And so I was able uh, really to come back home and um, establish myself at Prairie State. And I was there for about 20 years, would have been 20 years before I got appointed to the bench. So uh, legal aid became my passion and my mission and uh, really enjoyed my work there. I, I um, really did a lot of trial work. I did a lot of work in the family law area and public benefits and housing and um, just um, found it to be very rewarding to help those that are less fortunate and that would not otherwise have a voice in the court system. And so um, that was my, my career path. Um, I think it really helped me um, to be a better person and a better attorney, and then ultimately um, a, a judge that can listen. And particularly with the number of pro se litigants that we have now, I think my experience at Legal Aid really um, has helped me in that in that particular arena. So. So that was my path um, to, and then had the good fortune of being appointed to the bench in uh, 2009 and have had lots of different experiences um, in terms of courtrooms. So I've really enjoyed it. Great, thank you. And Judge Walker? So Rachel, when you selected the three of us, you probably didn't know, and I didn't know until I've just heard my co-presenters speak that you selected, I think, three uh, small town girls, here. <laughs> um, women now, of course. But, um, so I grew up on a farm in West Central Illinois near Carthage. And those of you who know, I sit in Cook County. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm a long way from home um, uh, from that farming community. And I'm also a first gen lawyer. Um, I would have to tell you that the first thing that sparked my interest in, in maybe going to law school someday was reading Nancy Drew novels. Mm -hmm. Her dad was a lawyer mm -hmm. and I would read about the things that, that he provided to her and the things that he would do and the things she learned from him uh, from, from reading every single Nancy Drew book there was, you know. So um, that's how I first learned about the law uh, was just uh, as, a, as a child. Uh, my dad was a farmer. My mom was a homemaker and helped on the floor. She had been a teacher. Um, I also went to a very small high school, graduated with a class of only 74 students, went on to the University of Illinois and was an accounting major at U of I. And I had thought about going to law school straight off uh, after I graduated, but I passed the CPA exam on my first try and I thought, you know, I should find out what it's like to, uh, to work as a CPA. 
So I did that for a couple of years and, and I found that it really didn't feed my soul. I mean, I think I was pretty decent at it, but uh, I felt like I didn't get enough uh, interaction with plants um, and that type of, of a thing when I was working as a, as a young auditor and tax preparer. Yeah, I did that and stayed in Champaign with McGladry. And then I decided after doing that for a couple of years, I, I would go to law school and I, I got again into U University of Illinois. So I lived in Champaign-Urbana for nine years. It was a good uh, middle ground for a farm kid like me uh, to be there for nine years before I, I moved to Chicago uh, upon graduation from law school. Uh, I worked uh, as a trial lawyer for 21 years. I, I did defense side work. Um, uh, started with Williams Montgomery, ended with Clawson Miller, uh, did malpractice defense work primarily for 21 years. Um, uh, starting after uh, being a lawyer for 12 years, I decided I would like to be a judge. A lot of my friends were getting on the bench. Uh, I thought it would be something I would uh, excel at. And so I started trying every single way to get on the bench, met with Supreme Court justices to ask if I could get an appointment, I tried the associate judge process four different times in Cook County. I learned that that was probably more political than running in Cook County. And finally, I ran in 2008 and was elected on, on my first try um, in 2008. But uh, for those of you who may be interested in a future career on the bench, I would tell you, you know, you have to persevere. Don't give up. If, it, if you think it's going to be your life's passion, you have to just keep at it because it took me nine years of trying, literally. Uh, to get on the bench. And now I sort of feel like I've come full circle because what do I use most often, um, you know, every day in my life on the bench? Uh, because I handle the financially complex divorce trials for Cook County. Uh, never, try, never had a divorce case as a lawyer in 21 years, you know, but, uh, but I find that it's really a niche uh, for me uh, to use my CPA background every day in trying these financially complex divorces. So I think a, a lot of your life kind of comes together um, uh, in pursuing your goals. And that's certainly been true for me. Thank you all so much. Um, so this next question, um, it's kind of multi-pronged, but I wanted to ask, um, and for this, we'll, we'll start with Judge Wilson. Um, if there were any women in particular who either, you know, influenced you to step into the career um, that you're in um, or into the legal field or who mentored you during that. Um, and then kind of a, a related question is, you know, if who are your women role models in the legal field? Um, so, you know, that's kind of women you may or may not know. Um, so if you if you could speak to that, Judge Wilson. Um. I, I don't know that I necessarily had any women lawyers, you know, before I went into the practice, um, but I certainly um, had women that I worked with um, through legal services, both at Land of Lincoln and Prairie State, that um, my, my uh, managing attorney in Peoria was a female and so I was, you know, she was definitely someone that I, I looked up to that I could ask questions of. And she gave um, me opportunities to handle matters that, you know, I, I felt like it, it stretched me a lot um, as a lawyer, but it was a really good thing. And she also gave me opportunities to serve in terms of public speaking and really being engaged in other committees and things where um, I could make a difference in the community. And so I, I, I've been very, very fortunate to work with women um, who have really helped shape me and, and really gave me opportunities. And, and so I always look at it as, you know, paying it forward. So I always knew like when I became um, managing attorney of Prairie State Legal Services, it was really important for us to have a diverse staff, um, not just in experience and ethnicity, but just, um, just different experiences as well, because I knew that would make our office stronger and would make the community better as a result. Um, there have been, we have had very few female judges in our circuit, uh, mm -hmm. historically. <laughs> so when I first started at um, Prairie State, there was one female judge 
who ironically, um, when she retired, I got appointed to her position. So it, that was kind of a neat um, thing for me. Um, she was a trailblazer. Her and I, our personalities are completely different. Um, but I very much respected her and uh, her ability to work amongst 19 men on the bench um, and make a name for herself as well as for those of us that would come behind. Um, so I, I've seen our female judges as role models as well for me, uh, particularly those that were first appointed um, and really had to deal with um, more issues than I've had to as a female judge. Mm -hmm. In terms of role models um, of people that I don't even know, um, I, would name, I, I would name a couple of people that I do know. There's a lot of wonderful female judges in the state of Illinois. Um, one that I really admire because I've had more opportunities to work with her is Justice Mary Jane Tice on the Illinois Supreme Court. Um, and I've gotten to know her through the Illinois Judicial College, um, which I, I serve on the board of that. Um, in terms of those that I don't know, but have always admired is Hillary Clinton, um, because her background was as a lawyer. Um, obviously, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, Sonia mm -hmm. Sotomayor, um, those are uh, role models um, that you know I follow have always been interested in their career paths and they've definitely made a big difference um, in our country, so, so. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what about Judge, Judge Walker? How about you? Yeah, so after my uh, freshman undergraduate year at the University of Illinois, I went home for the summer to Carthage and I was really fortunate to be hired you know, just minimum wage, like as a gopher, as whatever needed to be done at the law firm. Um, for a small firm in Carthage, actually, it was the biggest firm with like four lawyers, okay, all men. But Stanley Tucker, who was an Illinois law alum and Illinois undergrad, he saw something in me and he gave me an offer to assist the firm. I filled in for the, the legal secretaries when they took their summer vacations. I made trips to Springfield and other neighboring courthouses to do filings, you know, back in the day when things couldn't be done electronically, they actually had people run errands. And, you know, I, I um, also had to file things in the library that could come as a big shock to a lot of our mm -hmm. younger, um, folks on the call today, because that was when you had to update and file things. Uh, things were not, again, electronically available. So I had that experience offered to me by a man. When I became a young lawyer at Williams Montgomery. Again, the partner I was assigned to was a man who took me under his wing. He was a phenomenal trial lawyer. Uh, there was a year when he tried, I think it was eight juries, and he won, he got not guilties, all juries. Mark Miller was his name. I still periodically see him. He lives in Florida had an opportunity to see him in May. Uh, so I would have to say that most of my mentors uh, were men, uh, wonderful men who took an interest in supporting young women. And I will also say that uh, my, my summer associate time at my first law firm, <clears throat> I was assigned a mentor and it was a woman. And she did take me out to lunch like the first week, which I think they were supposed to do. And then she virtually ignored me for the rest of the summer. So luckily I was able to go to a more recent uh, alum from my law school, U of I, and, and she took me under her wing for the summer, but she was not my assigned mentor. And, and when I had that experience and I was at a law firm that uh, was very slow to even have its first female partner um, because that occurred after I had joined the firm in 1987. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I made a vow to myself that I would be a mentor to many women. And that's probably what set me on the path of getting very involved in the Women's Bar Association of Illinois and uh, serving as that mentor to so many women, which I have done, um, many through the Women's Bar, 
many law students from my alma mater and from other law schools in Chicago um, that I've had as externs. I've made it a, a life goal to be a mentor for as many uh, young women as, as possible. Um, and really stemming from that life experience where I felt that the, the women didn't mentor as they really should have. Um, and so, uh, and that also, so that spurred me into the women's bar. And when I got to the women's bar association and I was starting to serve as chair of different um, committees like the program committee, uh, a, a different women's bar past president took an interest in me, Justice Marianne McMorrow, our first woman on the Illinois Supreme Court. Um, and she would encourage me. I chaired the joint professional dinner and I chaired the program committee and I put together all these great luncheon speakers. And she said, you need to get on the board and you need to get in line to be president of this organization. And through her mentorship and encouragement, I, I did end up becoming a fairly young um, not as young as Kate Conway, Judy, um, but I became a very young, at the age of 38, president of the Women's Bar Association. And I owe so much to Justice McMorrow. She also appointed me to what became, was called the Committee on Civility of the Illinois Supreme Court, which became the Commission on Professionalism. And if there's anything that has really defined my career as both a lawyer and a judge, it's been my nearly 20 years of service on the Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism, which I chaired for six years. And I owe all of that really to Justice Marianne Moore. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Justice Case, what about you? So um, I didn't really have any mentors that were women. Um, as I indicated a little earlier, I went to Washington University School of Law. And so I returned to my hometown, which was Belleville, Illinois, um, when I graduated from law school. But I think I indicated I got lucky to be hired by a young lawyer who was a trial lawyer and did personal injury work for plaintiffs at that time. And so I decided I wanted to be a trial lawyer, but he wouldn't hire me, even though I had worked for him for two and a half years, there were not going to be any women trial lawyers. So luckily um, I convinced the state's attorney to give me a shot at being a woman prosecutor. And the state's attorney back then had had a very bad experience with a woman lawyer and he wasn't inclined to hire another one. Hmm. So, my boss who was involved politically uh, arranged for an introduction. And I don't know exactly why, but I got hired in the juvenile court system to prosecute. And I had my eyes opened wide from um, what happens in the juvenile system to children with neglect. And it was an eye-opening experience to see children burned and whipped and beat. And I realized at that point in time that not only did I want to help victims, but my time as a prosecutor would allow me to then go into personal injury law representing other victims of terrible tragedies. So I really got my start in the personal injury business by my experience as a prosecutor, I was a prosecutor for four years in the St. Clair County State's Attorney's Office, and I thought I built a pretty good reputation as the only woman there. We hired a couple more, but then nobody would hire me. <laughs> so I hung out my own shingle for six months, and I advertised in the TV Guide back then. <laughs> and uh, I actually got some business. You know, I was from there. My dad was... Uh, he owned a little store on Main Street. My mom was a teacher. And so people started coming to me and um, I did small claims and things like that. And one day I got a call from a gentleman who had a fairly large firm in those days, you know, maybe eight people, but they did Jones Act cases and FELA cases because we were right there on the Mississippi River. So we had barge cases, railroad cases, and there was a man in the firm named Rex Carr who was an icon in product liability cases. 
But his partner, Sandy Coring, came to visit me one day at my little office. We, we took a closet and we put paneling on the sides of the walls. We covered the furnace and I put a metal desk in the uh, office and I rented a secretary by the hour. And um, Mr. Coring came into my office one day with a cigar that was about 12 inches long. And he lit up that cigar while we were in the office. And he told me that he wasn't sure that he could hire a woman, but he'd really like to give it a try. So uh, the rest is history. I joined the firm of Carr Corine and um, there were no women there either. <laughs> Judy, but what year was that? 1982. Mm. So, um, but Mr. Carr was a very progressive guy and he allowed me to go to seminars that were put on by the Illinois Trial Lawyers and the American Association of Justice, which is, was formerly known as ADLA. And through that, I saw two women who became my mentors, uh, Linda Atkinson and Mary White, and they put on seminars and I started following them around the country to their seminars because they had great ideas about interrogatories and requests to admit, things that I had never thought about or heard about. And Mr. Carr let me go to meetings. And then I met women trial lawyers at the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association. Mm -hmm. But those women weren't really in power. What I realized was that the people who were really in power were the men. And I was very blessed to get to know Cooney and Conway and Bob Clifford's office and meet the women there. And so I litigated on behalf of personal injury clients for about 34 years. And through my association with the trial lawyers, I was again, very blessed to, to be elected to the um, presidency of the Illinois trial lawyers. Soon we will have another woman president. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad for that. The Illinois trial lawyers have been in um, existence since 1952. But um, my litigation experience, I did a lot of medical malpractice work. I had national class action experience. And after about 34 years, um, I too, um, during that time, felt that the most important thing I could do was pay back. And I have to tell the women who are on this call that my very first deposition, you won't believe this, but the men actually threw paper clips at me. They weren't used to having a woman in the room. And so the next time I went to a deposition, I took M&Ms and I told them, if you're gonna throw something at me, at least throw something that I can enjoy. So um, that kind of stopped that. But anyway, um, after about 34 years of, of trial work, I decided that I'd like to be on the bench. And again, I had some of the same experiences that Judge Walker described. They're, they weren't ready for an appellate judge. They already had the woman on the bench. We had one woman uh, serving out of seven, Melissa Chapman. And um, so I ran and I was elected and um, Ju Justice Chapman retired and I now sit as the only woman on our court of seven. Uh, so um, <laughs> it's, it's been a lonely existence, but as a paying forward, I've been mentoring as many women as I possibly can during my career. I hire women and I'm very proud of the women that I've mentored. They've gone on to be very successful lawyers and professors and things like that. So um, I think the biggest part of our um, impact for those of us who had trouble climbing is to pay forward. And, and I think every judge on this uh, panel recognizes that and believes in it strongly. Um, mm -hmm. The last thing I wanna say is as far as a role model, I, I too believe the women on the US Supreme Court are wonderful women and should be admired for their accomplishments. But I wanna mention Justice Rita Garman because um, I appeared in, just in front of Justice Garman when she was on the trial bench. And I had two very difficult cases in Vermilion County, Danville. 
And I was sure that they would never be resolved because they were medical malpractice cases and um, Justice Garman got it done. And I was just amazed at her ability on the bench. Um, and I was told that, you know, I was warned about Justice Garman that she was very serious judge and that she, she wouldn't get this done and she did. And she did both both cases. So I've always admired Justice Garman for her work. Thank you. You know, as you all are, are speaking, it, it makes me think of how much things have changed and how much things haven't. Uh, you know, just last month, a lawyer friend of mine in Kentucky was all upset, called me. She went to a deposition and everyone thought she was the court reporter and she was, she was taking it and, you know, and, you know, the court reporter showed up on her and, <laughs> right and you know and so that is you know it's 2022 and that is you know people's biases as to what roles people hold are still very strong um so that you know i think justice cape kind of talked about you know a lot of this already so i want to get um judge walker and judge wilson's take on you know have you had any experiences whether in practice or on the bench where you know you thought advocates or um colleagues you know may have treated you differently um, because, you know, because you're a woman. Um, Judge Walker? Well, I can say this uh, from, um, again, my passions are mentoring women. They are um, educating uh, judges and lawyers on diversity, equity, and inclusion, on anti-harassment, anti-bullying, uh, civility issues primarily because of the 20 years I spent on the Commission on Professionalism. So uh, why am I so passionate about these topics? Uh, I can begin by telling you that uh, when I was a young CPA, I was discriminated against based on my gender. Um, when I uh, was a summer associate, I was sexually harassed by a male partner of the firm. This was the summer of 1986. And I felt um, unable to really report it to the firm because I knew that I needed to get an offer from the law firm before I left for the summer, before I went back to U of I to do my last year of law school. It was incredibly important to get that job offer. So I was afraid to report this lecherous uh, male partner of the firm for his um, sexual harassment of me at a associate outing, firm outing to a baseball game is where this happened at, the, at Wrigley Field. But I did tell the, the uh, younger lawyer that I mentioned earlier who took me under her wing that summer, I told her what happened. And when I got back to U of I, a couple of months later, I get a call from her. She tells me that this same partner was now being accused of sexual harassment of a first year associate at the firm. He was making comments about her breasts or things. Um, and she wanted to know if she could tell the managing partner what had happened to me over the summer. Uh, well, by this time, of course, I had my job offer. I had accepted it. I knew that my, um, my bar review course would be paid for, that I was going to get like half of my salary for the summer while I studied for the bar, that I had a job to go to. So I said to her, sure, you can tell him. But uh, if he wants to know more, if he wants to really hear it from the horse's mouth, he should call me. Well, he didn't call me, but by the time I uh, reported to work there, uh, at, after the bar exam, that uh, partner who had engaged in sexual harassment was gone. I also experienced sexual harassment at the second law firm where I took a job, and that sexual harassment was from the managing partner. Um, and so um, it really lit a fire in me. Um, I uh, authored the uh, first sexual harassment policies for my first law firm, uh, for my church, the first sexual harassment policies. I started uh, learning more and writing more about that topic as a lawyer. 
uh, trying to make uh, a change for the women who came after me. Uh, I also learned at my first law firm that I wasn't making the same amount of money as the men who started uh, at the same time I did. Um, so, uh, and I think that these uh, issues are persistent. They still exist. Uh, we have just had a, uh, a male lawyer in, uh, who practices in the domestic relations division. Uh, he's before the ARDC. He's before the criminal courts for um, allegations of sexual abuse of women who he employed. And we're talking about in the last five years. Um, he had, has been accused of um, sexually uh, harassing and intimidating uh, the mothers of children. He was a famous uh, child rep in the Circuit Court of Cook County Domestic Relations Division. Um, and according to some of the mothers of children he was appointed to represent, they said that he would tell him thing, them things like, if you have sex with me, the judge, I'm well known, and the judge will grant you custody of your child. Um, so uh, all of this is yet to be seen. If he's convicted criminally of uh, sexual assault, um, if he if he loses his uh, license to practice law, but uh, the the bottom line is that these things are still happening, and we have to all I, I educate lawyers and judges on what to do when they see something that they need to say something that they can tell the judge if something mm -hmm. happened out in the hallway or in the judge's uh, conference room, uh, they need to report it. And I've written articles about this and I teach on these topics to again, try to make a difference for women. But so it's sort of like, um, I, I think things are gradually improving but there are still some bad apples out there. Uh, I think there are still women who are not being uh, paid the same amount by their law firms as uh, equally situated men. And I would like to see a further change occur for our profession uh, very, very soon. Mm -hmm. I saw this, um this like bot in, uh, I think it was in um, Britain um, yesterday because they have uh, all their salaries for employers with like 250 employees or more are public. And so this bot was, you know, someone made this so that a, a company would post, you know, something for International Women's Day and it would respond and say, thank you, you pay your women employees 36% less than the men. Um, so they were really, you know, calling out companies for kind of not, you know, walking the talk. Um, so, you know, definitely an ongoing issue. Um, Judge Wilson, anything to add here? Not really, I think it was really well covered by Justice Cates and, and Judge Walker. I don't really have more to add. I would, okay. I would concur that I've had some of the similar experiences when I was practicing. And I think even as a female judge, sometimes um, the lawyers can be disrespectful, um, not just to me, but I've seen it occur with other uh, female judges on the bench. So it's just being, you know, what your approach is to that, um, particularly as a judge. And if you see something going on within your courtroom, if there's a male attorney, female attorney, I think as a judge, you can somewhat step in and try uh, in a civil way to say, you know, that that's not going to be allowed, um, it, you know, from a civility standpoint. So that's where I've seen it happen more recently um, with being a judge. Mm -hmm. And I just think we, we have to hold people accountable for their actions in the, in the courtroom. And even if it takes place outside the courtroom. Sure. So I'm going to pass the baton over to Judy to uh, continue asking some questions and she'll take it from here. So I just wanna pick up on some of the things that you all have mentioned so far. Um, I think I'll just stick on the topic of kind of the discrimination or the microaggressions um, that, you know, I'm sorry to hear you've experienced and, um, you know, I'm pretty confident I can say of all the women on here, um, we've all had something like that happen to us too. Um, do you have any advice or suggestions about how to handle those situations when they arise and how, you know, women lawyers can appropriately advocate for themselves, um, you know, without kind of jeopardizing their position or, you know, um, reputation? 
Well, I can, I can begin here for us. Um, yeah, I have a lot of suggestions. Uh, so I think uh, if, it, if it's something that's occurring in a law firm, I think it has to be reported. Um, Bridget Dignan is on with us and Bridget uh, uh, drafted the Illinois Workplace Transparency Act. I think this is a huge step forward for uh, women in that um, uh, all employers in the state of Illinois now have to engage in at least annual harassment training. So, um, you know, assuming that um, the people who need, need to hear the message are being educated on this topic, hopefully we're gonna see some change. But if something happens to um, a younger woman attorney uh, in her firm, I think uh, we need to embolden them to come to someone who's trusted who will help them navigate that scenario. I think it needs to be reported to an HR director if the firm is too small to have one, uh, to uh, the managing partner. If it's the managing partner who's engaging in the harassment, I think whoever's next in charge, uh, but it needs to be reported because if it's not reported, of course, it just continues to happen to more and more people. If it's something that happens, uh, you know, uh, like I was saying, outside in the hallway, um, uh, outside the courtroom, uh, come in the courtroom right away and say, Judge Walker, so-and-so just did this to me or just said this to me, you know, and let me have an opportunity to talk to that person. There are a lot of things we can do as judges. Mm -hmm. We see ageism, people making comments based on age. Well, that young, they don't know that. They only started practicing judge or vice versa. Something about an older practitioner that said, so ageism, sexism, all of those isms, racism, you know, if something occurs in my presence, I immediately say, that is so unnecessary. I expect better of you in this courtroom. You know, and I will often joke and say, you know, um, you know, I'm, I was the chair of the Commission on Professionalism. I'm not going to put up with this. I'm not going to have you uh, treating your opponent in an uncivil manner in this courtroom. You know, we all need to do something. If it's something, uh, you know, I had put lawyers out in the hall and said, you can come back in after a time out. If you're going to behave like a child in my courtroom, I'm going to treat you like one. You're in time out, out in the hall until you can come in, apologize to this court, apologize to your opposing counsel. Uh, uh, I have even had a situation where I have never talked about the substance of the case, but if somebody, I've seen this behavior a few times before me from the same person, I'll say, I want you to meet me in chambers. We're going to have a conversation about your behavior and how prove it, not just for me, but for all the judges in this building, you know, uh, and you have to admonish and say, this is not acceptable, you know, and again, of course, you're not going to have an ex parte conversation about the substance of the case when you have that person in your chambers, but you're going to have a chat with them. If you see something from another judge, I mean, here in Cook County, my goodness, we had Mauricio Rojo, he was sexually harassing other judges sexually harassing deputies who was sexually harassing court reporters and he, he has been you know well he ended up he knew he was going to be removed from the bench after his trial before the courts commission so he he resigned but you know if you see something of another judge we have an obligation to do something to say something right away to that judge report to our presiding judge to our chief judge um, things have to be done have friends on the bench who've been sexually harassed by our colleagues, female judges who've been sexually harassed by male judges, and it has to end. And so uh, we need to do what we can to see that it ends, all of us. Yeah, I think what Judge Walker is saying is really important. And um, I think part of it is continually be willing to be educated on on these issues and what you what you can do. And then you really have to take the action because if you're implicit and you just, you don't do anything as Judge Walker and Ju Justice Kate stated, it just keeps perpetuating. And, you know, other people are become victims uh, to the situation. And so we, you know, we are trained as lawyers you know, to stand up for others and to advocate. And this is where we can, we can advocate and try to put a stop to improper and sometimes illegal behavior. You know, um, 
I just want to add, you know, Judge Walker is a leader in this kind of um, isms, if you will, and making sure that this doesn't happen. The reality, though, is that there are 50 plus to 100 counties in Illinois where we have lawyers practicing in small firms in small towns where this can't be reported because there is no one to report it to without losing your job. And so I think one of the issues that we have to face as women is that there must be consequences. In other words, you, if something happens to you and you're in a small firm and you, you don't have anyone to turn to, the first thing you have to say is, this is not acceptable. I think we have to be able as women to have the strength that when it happens to say it's not okay, mm -hmm. which is the reporting requirement, but sometimes there's nobody to report it to. And if it's not okay, you have two choices. You have to either, if there's no one to report it to, you have to either report it to a bar association or you have to change your career path with that firm because sometimes you cannot change the actor and the actor is somebody who controls your life in such a way that it's going to happen again. So I think the reality is we have to look at not just the urban areas, but the um, areas where women are, are trapped, if you will, and have no one to report it to. But I think one of the issues is consequences. If we don't start having consequences, even if it's timeouts, we, we, we are not going to get anywhere. Um, for me, consequences was winning a case. Uh, I had an exploding tire case where the, the lawyer came up to me and said, what does a woman know about changing a tire? Well, when I won the case, I knew a lot about changing that tire. <laughs> You know, and so for me, um, the con there were consequences, but um, sometimes you just don't have anybody to report to. And you got to stand up and say, it's not okay. It's not okay. I don't appreciate it. And then you have to make a decision on where your career path is going to go. I think... Um... To, to follow up on what was said by Judge Wilson and Justice Cates, this is where your networks can really help you. If you're in a smaller town uh, where there aren't, maybe there may not even be another woman attorney in the town, but maybe the next town over, I, you know, I'm thinking of my, about my hometown of Carthage. I, I'm not sure that there's any female attorneys there now, but you know, over in Macomb and Quincy, there's female lawyers. And if you can belong to a bar association where you're networked and you can call them and say, hey, what do you think I should do here? You know, and, and I think that for the most part, people will say, oh, OK, and maybe they'll even help you get a new job. Maybe they have a space in their firm where, where it gives you an out from, from that particular place. But, um, you know, anything that younger women can do to be well networked whether it's bar associations or book clubs or women's organizations or whatever, to sort of be emboldened and empowered to do what, what Justice Kate says, make sure there are consequences. And Justice Kate's, when I got my first car, which was like a 1977 Chrysler Newport, which cost about $2,000, my dad made me change the tire on the car on a gravel farm driveway before I could drive the car. <laughs> but I agree with you that networking is so very important. I think that's a really great comment you made. Yeah, I think the networking is key as well. And I think um, what's been touched upon previously is mentorship, being willing to be a mentor to others, um, I think that's really key too, because then you build trust, you can share experiences, you can help provide direction. You know, if you're a mentor to someone and they're experiencing something like this, or, um, you know, they, they have the ability to share it with you, they trust you, and then they're looking to you for, you know, I'm not necessarily looking to you to fix this, but can you give me some direction on what I need to do or how I need to 
handle the situation. So I think those are really key. Um, and it, they've been beneficial to me both as a mentee and as being a mentor. I think those are really wonderful points. Um, and just as a plug, I know you all have been very active in bar associations and we're here as part of the ISBA, but um, you know, I'm, I'm in the Women's Caucus of the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association, um, the Women on Committee, uh, Committee on Women in the Law with the ISBA and the Women's Bar Association. And those listservs are an endless resource um, for anything and everything. And so um, you guys have all mentioned that, but just want to make sure everyone knows those are out there and that, um, you know, get on them, get involved. You can absorb information. You can ask just about anything. Um, and people even put personal questions on there. You know, I need advice mm -hmm. for a nanny or, you know, tips for being a working mom um, outside mm -hmm. of just legal related. Um, since we're running short on time, um, just as a last one, I was hoping maybe you guys could leave us with some of your parting thoughts about ways that um, all of us could take steps to help uh, support women's progress in the legal field, um, especially acknowledging we have some younger attorneys here who uh, might not quite be in a position to act as a mentor, um, but who probably are actively hoping uh, and seeking one out. Well, uh, go ahead. I'll go ahead and start. Um, you know, I think that it kind of depends um, where you're at as far as what you can do. Um, but I, I think women have to demonstrate uh, three things in the work field. And um, I think one is strength. I think you have to show people that you are strong, that you um, can do the job uh, and you're willing to, to speak up for yourself. So I think the corollary to that is you need to be independent. You need to be indispensable to your um, friends and coworkers and managing partners. And most of all, I think one of the things women need to have is humility not subservience, not to be confused with subservience. But sometimes uh, women think that when you're strong, that means you're loud. And I don't think loud is something that can accomplish a lot. There's a big, big difference between being loud and being strong. And I call that humility. And I think that it, it, there's an old saying, you know, you, you can get further if you offer them what is it, Deborah Candy? Then, if you. <laughs> My mom always used to say, uh, you can get farther with honey than with vinegar. Right. Honey than with vinegar. Yeah. Yes, it was escaping mm -hmm. me. You're right. Um, and, and that's really what I'm saying is so when I group my career into a, a package, I kind of think of three words, and that's strength independence and humility. And I, I encourage, I think that all women, if you keep those thoughts in mind about how you navigate this very difficult career, this is a difficult career. Don't think this is easy, even in 2022. I have a daughter who's in big law and I'm astounded at how things haven't changed and how things haven't changed. I have a niece in big law and it's, it's just mind boggling to me, but I give my daughter the same advice and that is be independent, indispensably independent, be strong and be humble. I wish you all a wonderful and successful career and thank you for allowing me to join this very distinguished committee panel. Um, I could also add that um, for the men who are on with us and for you women, maybe women who are um, have a few years under their belts uh, or more than a few years under their belts, um, you can be an ally. So allyship is very important. It might mean interrupting somebody in a meeting. Okay. So you're in a meeting and a young woman or a person of color just made a wonderful suggestion on a new plan, a new strategy for the law firm. And people didn't really respond. And three minutes later, a man at the table says the same thing. 
And everybody is applauding this man for this idea. And so you interrupt that by saying, hey, Bianca just made that suggestion. Um, she gets the credit. You know, redirecting the conversation, being an ally, giving uh, folks who traditionally haven't received the same level of support, your support. Um, uh, of course, um, that's a little different than being a mentor, but being an ally, I think is really strong. And also what can we do? We can support women who are seeking leadership roles. We can support Bridget Dignan, who's running for third vice president of the ISBA. The more we get women into the corner office, the C-suite, the presidencies of our organizations, the more things will change. Um, they have to. People will see them as the leaders and know that they're very competent, that they're independent, that they're strong, like what Justice Kate said. And they'll be able to accomplish more because of your support for getting them into those leadership roles. I really don't have anything else to add because those would be the, the things that I would state as well. I think just always being willing um, to give um, women opportunities that they might not otherwise have, you know, helping uh, to be a voice and encouraging them and I think one of the things that we didn't really touch upon, but those of us that have families that um, are trying to balance both um, our family lives, as well as our careers, as well as everything else that we're doing um, in the community, I think that that can always be a challenge. And that's where, you know, having um, good uh, folks within the profession that you can bounce things off of, that you can... Um, rejoice in things with and commiserate uh, with them, I think is really, really important. And that's where that networking comes in. If you can't find that within your office or realm, you know, always having somebody available that you can speak with, especially in times of stress, you know, when you're trying to balance all of these things. So you can't be really good at everything um, all the time. And so it's good to always try to find that balance and have people that you can reach out to if you need the support. Love those, those are wonderful tips. Thank you all so much. Um, Judy, so I had a friend um, from, oh, go ahead. Judy, I wanna interrupt you just one minute. Um, you know, this has been a great panel, but I wanna say to all of the people out there that I'm certainly open to further questions. Uh, should this, your, your, your participants have any, issues that they want to raise. And I'm happy to share my email in the chat um, after this is over or now, whichever is easier for you all. Um, but I certainly am willing to carry on with continued mentoring as a result of this program. Thank you so much. That is so generous of you. And thank folks you all always, for, for your yeah, time. Folks can always contact me too. And it has been a pleasure. Uh, yeah. really. Talk to you all and to serve with Justice Gates and Judge Wilson. Thank you. Yes, um, it's been great to be on this panel, and I too would be willing um, to be a resource as well. So you can feel free to share my email as well. And thank you, everybody, for participating. We appreciate it, and the ISBA for sponsoring. Thank you so much. I uh, just thought I would leave you all with um, a post that I saw yesterday for International Women's Day. Um, it said, women can do anything men can do, and it's crossed out, and it says, men are not the standard of greatness or righteousness that women should be expected to live up to. Women can do anything and everything that they want to. So that would leave us on that note. Thank you all for your wonderful insights, and I look forward to uh, everything that you guys continue to do, and um, I am sure that you will have a lot of young lawyers reaching out to you. So thank you for all of your insights today. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.